Winter Storm 2009, a catastrophic weather event that forever changed lives and even the very landscape of our region. For the next hour and a half, we'll take a look back at this historic storm, hear stories of survival as well as lessons learned during the recovery effort. Now we begin with a piece put together by photojournalist Michael Driver, a snapshot of the ice storm and the people who endured it. To Eddie Central. I was just down some wires down 2000 block of B Street. There's a tree uh, hung over the telephone line. Multiple lines down, multiple trees, impassable. If you add that to the list, it is bad, real bad. There goes his power again. I had a hell of a night. Rough. Heat all shut down, nothing. The trees falling down over the roof. Whoa! It's unreal. City of Mayfield will not be back up on power for seven to ten days. Uh, West Kentucky Rural Electric, 21 to 30 at best. We've got about 585,000 people without power across Kentucky. There's no heat, there's no light, these apartments are dark. It's really cold now. This is about the worst I can remember. We have premium and diesel and all, but I've just got this little $50 generator. It'll run one pump. The line's been down the road both ways, uh, watching cars in and out. Everybody come in, turn around, go back out because there ain't no gas here. I've been waiting for over two hours just to check out. Was it worth it? Oh, yeah, if I want to eat. <laughs> The line's not too bad. It's moving pretty fast. We're only waiting about a half hour or next to go in. What are you missing the most right now? Water and lights. We've been getting some heat just from burning candles, but we're all out of candles now. There's a lot of older folks here that, that they can't handle this. I don't know what we're doing. I have no idea what we're doing anymore. It'll all be okay. It'll be okay. I could sit around and moan about it, but it ain't gonna do me any good, is it? This has been the biggest disaster, uh, natural disaster in the state's history. We're going to be okay. It's going to take a while, and we're going to have to dig out of this, but we're going to get through it. Hi, I'm Local 6 Chief Meteorologist Jennifer Okavina. Winter Storm 09, Kentucky's worst widespread weather event in history. Two main ingredients made it a recipe for disaster. Early in the weekend before the storm, January 24th and 25th, High pressure built in from Canada, spilling Arctic air southward into the mid-Mississippi Valley. Then on Monday, the Gulf of Mexico was wide open with moisture, and that moisture streamed our way going into Monday evening. The two created freezing rain, and that's what led to our significant icing event that crippled most of the region. Freezing rain can be explained as simply this. You have cold air aloft where Initially, that precipitation starts to fall as snow. It encounters a semi-warm layer in the mid-levels, which is what we were seeing from the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the moisture. As it fell through that layer, it melted and became rain. While at the surface, we still had that very cold air in place, and as it hit the surface, our power lines and trees, it froze on contact. That's that freezing rain. In many areas, it accumulated to two plus inches and that weight brought down several trees and power lines. Now let's take you back to Monday. The warnings came early, but what we couldn't expect is what unfolded on day one. Because the numbers will not be warming up and precipitation is moving in and it's going to be heavy. And this looks to be a major event for our area. By this time tomorrow morning, uh, there's gonna be a lot of problems if you're having to travel. This so. is Local 6 Midday. This afternoon is the time to get out and run your errands. An incoming winter storm tops our news at midday. And it's going to be a bad one. Unfortunately, for the folks to the north, we are talking a major snowfall. And for those farther south, sleet and ice. There are winter storms and then there are winter storms. <laughs> and this seems to be a, a major event, kind of a supersized winter storm for our region. This ice storm is going to be much worse than the one that hit our area just last year. Right? Yeah, this is going to be worse. And uh, again, we'll look at the totals coming up, but we could see over an inch of just pure ice. KIE 923 to Unit 35. Jackson Purchase Energy's dispatch room is the command center for 30,000 electric customers. 
It's where teams are keeping a close eye on the weather, and even before severe weather strikes, emergency plans are in place. In addition to getting crews prepared for an early morning, teams at Jackson Purchase also plan to stay late tonight and say when the dangerous weather comes, they'll be ready. Until then, they'll continue to watch and wait to see what Mother Nature brings. And the storm's actually gaining strength right now to our west. Make sure your family and you are braced for this. Be ready for this kind of storm. Jennifer Rukavina is part of our team coverage. She's here with a few tips for those folks in the last couple hours before things really start to turn south. Yeah, and the best thing to do is just be prepared. Be cautious, be prepared. The two major takeaways from that news conference today. Uh, the Illinois Department of Transportation has already treated the roads, pre-treated uh, pre them with a brine mixture now. Uh, that goal is to keep the roads safe and drivable and keep them at least open. Now, the traffic was moving pretty good just a couple minutes ago. One group you're not going to see out at this hour, though, are road crews. They've actually gone home to take a little bit of a break before coming back to work what is expected to be a very long and busy night. And those crews were out most of the day across our region. This is Local 6 at 6. It's coming, folks. A massive storm will blanket our region with snow, sleet, and ice. Tonight, people are preparing for the worst. The storm is coming, bringing with it a dangerous wintry mix. We're already starting to see freezing rain and some light sleet falling, especially along I-55 there. A wider view showing that this is just the start of This could be the worst storm in two decades. Mm -hmm. Those words tonight from the National Weather Service and Paula, National Weather Service doesn't talk like that. What do people that are watching need to know? The experts there, Paula, at the National Weather Service not painting a very nice picture over the next 12, 24, 48 hours simply because we could see some dangerous situations. And I specifically asked if they thought this storm has the potential to injure people or worse. Here's what they said. Absolutely. You know, people need to take this very seriously. That's why we're here today. Just to be prepared. Joyce Andrews remembers the last time we had a nice storm. Our power went out. For days. Well, not this time. I don't want to be that way. <laughs> today, she bought the last generator in stock at Lowe's. When the hurricane winds came through, our power went out. For a little while, our friends went out for a week. So she spent... $1,200. So that this time around, she wouldn't be in the dark or in the cold. You never know when your power's going to go out. So yeah, it's worth it. So all trucks are out in McCracken County looking for any slick spots. Other crews are also preparing for the storm by mixing that salt brine, and then local businesses are getting their parking lots ready so employees can get safely to, to work. Sleet, snow, and freezing rain, the first of a two-part winter storm system making its way across the region tonight. Check out this video taken within the last hour. This is where it started to come down again in the Paducah area along Lone Oak Road. And then in Marion, Illinois, freezing rain and sleet came down along Route 13 and Interstate 57 just within the last hour. Very dangerous conditions through the overnight hours. Please stay inside. This is a dangerous winter storm that's moving into the region. Already dealing with this nice thick layer of ice and taking a little bit of effort, although it's still slushy and coming on down. US 45 Brookport Bridge over the Ohio River. That's been closed due to icing. Things can just turn dangerous in an instant when you've got all of this ice already hitting the ground. In fact, uh, the camera lens might be freezing over, so we're hoping you can see this. Certainly you can hear me. This is, let's say, the average road. Well, guess what? That's all ice. It's not until you start digging with my shoe here that you actually hit the pavement. A lot of people have generators now, but this is very important. You could send electricity back down those lines and create a deadly hazard for the people who are working to restore your power. The weather team is here. We're in place all night throughout the day tomorrow. We're not going anywhere. We will be here doing updates all night, so we'll be here for you. And we got a good 48 hours for we this We do. Thing. It's okay. going to be a long, long ride. And it turned out to be a very long ride indeed. You're watching Winter Storm 09, your local storm stories. In the next half hour, we'll continue our day-by-day -day look at the storm's onset. And also ahead, the response after the storm. Utility crews working very long hours, putting their very lives on the line to restore power. And Local 6's John Ed Warp will show us the tough choices people had to make just to survive bitter cold temperatures with no power or heat. But up next, day two with Winter Storm 09. The situation worsens as the sleet and ice coats roads, trees, and even power lines.
Local 6's special coverage of Winter Storm 09 continues now with day two of the storm. January 27th, roads and trees already covered with ice and sleet, but the worst was still to come. The government emergency response begins as the winter precipitation continued to fall. Entire local six viewing area under a winter storm warning this morning. Yeah, as he mentioned, we've just seen all sorts of weather overnight from the freezing rain to sleet and snow. Transformers are blowing as you all have experienced, and it only takes about a half of an inch of ice that is enough to bring some power lines, make them snap. Pretty much everything is out in downtown Mayfield. As we go through the day, things will continue to go downhill for many of us. And take a look at this video. Early this morning, a car crashed into a snow plow. This is exactly the kind of danger that can happen in weather like this. The roads are not pretty, especially those neighborhood roads and those even those city roads. And we may be only about a third of the way done with this entire winter storm. Now at Kentucky School closings, Ballard. We had a transformer blow very close to this uh, building. So we're on generator power at this time. Uh, bear with us, we're, we'll do our best. Mother Nature cast a beautiful but dangerous picture across most of our area. Ice that blankets, trees, and power lines is the main concern. Power crews say that ice has thousands, like Harold Drowns, without power. But even in his front yard, the ice was no match for this tree that fell on Drowns' house around 4 this morning. Yeah, there was no way. It fell from the weight of the ice. And uh, it, uh, it did tear my roof up uh, very bad, bad, probably some when I get it off. As bad as things are, we are not in a state of emergency, is that correct? Well, we're not yet. Perhaps by this afternoon, we will move into that phase. So some of the crews have had to pull off of their salting duties and get out their chainsaws and start cutting down trees. The yeah, limb fell on a power line. That ignited a small fire in the basement. And the ice caused a dangerous situation in McCracken County. The weight of the limb caused two lines to touch one another. That ice brought down numerous trees and power lines in western Kentucky, including this massive tree blocking Husband Road in McCracken County, forcing motorists to find an alternate route. The same scene was captured by our streamer net cameras near Calvert City and in Marshall County. The weight of the ice caused trees to bend and limbs to break, keeping road crews busy. Reporting more than 8,300 customers without power in the Marshall and Northern Middle Graves County areas. Paducah Power reports about 3,400 customers are without power. They had four circuits to go out between 2 and 5 this morning. It's clear linemen like John Burnett have their work cut out for them. It's just in spots, not, not all over the city. Now, here's the problem facing our crews today. It got so cold last night, the ice actually froze on the lines and weighted it down. As you can see, it snapped poles in some of our area, and unfortunately, that's a problem that's going to take days to fix. When things are this bad, it's all hands on deck. Utility crews are working up to 16 hour days. The emergency declaration will help us better protect the citizens of Kentucky and assist counties and communities that may need additional resources in the wake of last night's storms and in the face of even potentially worse weather to come. Southern Illinois drivers haven't seen this kind of weather in several years. 125 trucks like the one behind me here will work round the clock until all the roads are clear in the southern 16 most counties in Illinois. Their work is difficult. Moving this dense snow takes more effort and the mixture of sleet and snow keeps falling. It's tough on the trucks, but even harder if you're doing it by hand, especially when the snow and sleet keeps falling. I'm a workhorse, so I'm young. It didn't really, you know, I was like, all right, let's do this. He'll likely get up and start all over again to remove a fresh batch of snow tomorrow morning. Several warming centers have been established all over western Kentucky, but people are being asked if you go to bring blankets and other items, you're going to need to spend the night. The extent of the fire damage to Jamie Brown's rental property in Crittenden County is a hole in the ceiling and charred carpeting. Last night, he helped the family of five that lives here get out alive and save what they could. The attic was full of flames. Jamie says friends and family rallied together to make sure the parents' three sleeping children got out safely. They were also able to grab pictures and irreplaceable belongings. I got a friend of mine always, always any situation, he says, we got to have a teaching moment. Well, guess what this is? <laughs> I teach my kids something from this. Of a power line 
Lights. For firefighters across the region, it was a common alert all day. By early afternoon, Reedland Farley Fire Chief Richard Tapp responded to more than 20 calls like this one. So we checked to make sure there's no fire danger around any of the houses, and there were five or six houses affected by this one line to pull down. The call tells firefighters power lines are down. That means the possibility of an electrical fire. This time, first responders can quickly give the all clear, but they never know until they're on the scene how serious the situation is. Out of the 25 or so that we've ran, we've had two that were actual structure fires. They can't afford to minimize any possible threat. In an ice storm, that means a lot more calls than usual. Well, you're the only state right now with a state of emergency. So, you know, that, that's obviously a huge deal. But estimates now uh, coming out of northern Arkansas, 100. That's my case, 150,000 people without power, and obviously with things like that happening for the rest of the night, we're going to have more people uh, losing power. So it, it, it's still a very dangerous situation. Is it downright bad and dangerous out there? I would say by tomorrow morning it will be. Whoa! And as bad as it was on day two, things were about to get even worse. Ahead, we'll hear amazing stories of survival. Local 6's John Ed Warwick joins us later with a look at life inside the warming shelters. But next, day three, and the sense of desperation as a fresh blanket of snow falls on top of the ice and sleep. January 28th, day three of the storm, and people are starting to realize the full gravity of the situation. At this point, power's out in most places, and the eerie silence is broken only by the sounds of trees crashing through the ground, sirens, and chainsaws. In fact, the storm grabs the attention of people across the country as the national news begins to pick up the story. <laughs> Good morning, America on ice. A powerful winter storm system is dealing a crippling blow to much of the eastern half of the country. At least 19 dead, hundreds of thousands without power. The sheer weight of all that ice is snapping tree limbs, toppling power poles. Hundreds of thousands, as we mentioned, are without power. That's in Arkansas and Kentucky. Could be days before power is fully restored. When is this coming to an end? It's unbelievable. We're seeing some very heavy snow right now. All the snow is coming down on top of the ice. Right. It's so eerie to drive in and see just so much black. Creepy, creepy feeling. Firefighters had to battle fallen tree limbs to get to a fire. And the family was on their way home. They had to turn around and go to the fire station to report the fire in person because phone lines were down. My Amarant is reporting 8,400 people without power right now in this area. Paducah Power Crews. We're working to get power restored to Parkview Nursing Home overnight. A lot of people are wondering, where can we go to warm up? We maybe need uh, additional cots or blankets, but we can accommodate a number of other people. I think when daylight comes, folks are going to realize just how bad it is. The one thing everybody hears besides the sound of trees falling is the sound of chainsaws. Almost every secondary road is blocked. Ranges are falling on at least one lane on both sides. There are some life-threatening situations out there. So we have a jackknife pickup truck and trailer on I-57 in Marion, Illinois. Wow. Yep, that's when my power went. <laughs> that is my neighborhood. Five days is probably optimistic. You know, people cannot can only go so long without heat. Right. That Murray State University is going to close its campus. The anywhere is better than here. Folks here are forced to wait two or three hours, but they say it's worth it. Yeah, if I want to eat. A lot of crackers, mainly peanut butter. The Walmart on the south side of Paducah, customers were only allowed to spend $25 each. And the, some of the places that were open this morning ran out of stuff. They don't have anything anymore. Just got this little $50 generator. It'll run one pump. I was at the gas station in line for an hour and a half. People were pretty, pretty peeved. They were not too happy because some folks were getting out of their cars with their gas containers. Other people were getting mad that, you know, I've been sitting here waiting in line and you're cutting in front of me. We will find a way to get fuel in here. I'm on a way. I can't go nowhere. I spent the night in my truck last night. Well, it's every man for himself. Hope and pray to God you guys find somebody to come help us. 
but we met one family on a road trip from Miami to Colorado. It was just about time to fill up. And then finally, you just get to a point where there's nothing left. Their plan is to just wait it out until power comes back on. I mean, it's pretty much all they can do. We went for about 30 exits, 40 exits, and no gas stations were open, no food is being sold, can't even get a motel room. FEMA does not reimburse individuals. At a time like this, there are always those who are trying to cash in. We're setting up a shelter for people to spend the night. We've got a church on the other side of town in Fulton that's going to provide food. This is the drive Southern Illinois Cooperative crews are taking to damaged power lines. The road is bumpy and slick. You would uh, have to cut your, literally cut your way with a chainsaw. Doing this work, disaster relief work in different areas of the country, you find in the parts of disasters that the best come out people. We've got a lot more to come as Winter Storm 09, your local storm stories, continues. The National Guard arrives to help with the recovery effort as the government response kicks into high gear at every level. And up next, stories of survival. Local 6's Johnette Wark shows what people had to go through to get even the most basic necessities of life. Welcome back to Local 6's special coverage of Winter Storm 09. As the power outages increased, people started to wonder, do I have enough food? What about gas or kerosene for the heater? That created a log jam at the few stores that were even able to open. Hopefully you prepared on Monday. Gas stations across the region quickly running out of gas. We have no regular gas, unleaded gas, no kerosene. Been sitting here since approximately four or five yesterday. Just kind of been hanging out, waiting, hoping. And the news is there is no gasoline, mm. at least in the Paducah, Lone Oak, uh, Reedland surrounding area. We went for about 30 exits, 40 exits, and no gas stations were open. No food is being sold. Can't even get a motel room. Customers were only allowed to spend $25 each. <laughs> Folks actually waiting in line two, three hours, stocking up for the days without power. I've been waiting for over two hours just to check out. We have a fireplace, so we're planning to attempt to cook in the fireplace. It's been bad, you know, it's, uh, but it could be worse. That's the first time I've ever seen something this bad. We're actually filling these up for other people we know that are about out of propane. That we will find a way to get fuel in here. We are hearing that as of a few minutes ago that the Exxon station at exit 11 in McCracken County is still open. As soon as you said it, we got in the car and left. Well, if you do have to use gas, pack plenty of patience. You know, I don't know what's every man for himself. The line is really, really long inside. If you can get it, you better get it now. It might get worse around us. More help is on the way. A rolling relief truck that's seen its share of disasters, including Katrina, is making its way toward Mayfield, Kentucky. One cannot live on MREs alone. Thanks to the <laughs> Tyson Corporation, they won't have to. Meat's a huge expense, as everybody knows, and in, in this way, they can do a lot. Today, Greenland Methodist Church prepared meals for struggling local residents. It's been a joy to do it. It's basically the only place to eat, so... <laughs> You'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. After all the snow and ice finished falling, the temperatures plunged. That forced people with no heat or power to seek shelter elsewhere. Warming centers were set up across the region, and they began to fill up fast. When people began to realize their power may not come back on for days, possibly even weeks. Uh, we, we have an emergency shelter here. Police have brought, brought a number of folks in. If we don't have any power, we don't have uh, lights or heat. And I got stranded up here, so I don't know if my family's okay or anything. Yeah, I've never done this before. Never been in a shelter, never had, I've never seen a storm like this before. It's been okay. It could be better. She don't have any clue in the world what she's doing or going with her. Jenny Ann Carnes says keeping three little ones happy isn't easy. Several days without heat, power, and the comforts of home can wear on anyone, including kids. It's a big change from what we're used to. The Red Cross has a medical clinic staffed with registered nurses set up at the shelter. The National Guard Armory here has had some 300 people over the course of the week. Everything from sick kids to people who forgot their medications, those who are nervous and anxious, even pregnant moms and newborns. People remain here at Graves County High School 
for food and heat. Unlike anything I have ever seen before or anybody else that I know of around here has ever seen before. The task of bringing the city of Mayfield and Graves County back to life is overwhelming for emergency officials and city leaders. When the ice storm first hit, that number was almost 600 at Graves County. The shelter's being moved and school starts back there Monday, but not before our web journalist turned off his dash cam and called it a night. This is my bed. This is where I'm going to sleep. Got to go now. Cold weather and the threat of carbon monoxide forces families to leave their homes. Made the decision to clear residents out of the development uh, until power could be restored. A cot at the warming shelter set up at the National Guard Armory is where Ruth Wren will be sleeping indefinitely. I don't know what we're doing. I have no idea what we're doing anymore. The spirit of Kentuckians is just amazing. These folks, in spite of everything, still have a smile on their face. They're coming together. They're helping each other. And that's really what's going to get us through this more than anything else. It's understandable that a lot of people were reluctant to leave their homes. Now, we spoke with one man who learned firsthand about the dangers of staying in sub-freezing temperatures. Local 6 photojournalist Kurt Stewart captured a story of survival in Hickman County. Meet Ivan Potter. We decided it was going to be cold stay home and try to get through it. We lost all power, all electricity. Our only light we had in our bedroom was a candle. We were totally unprepared for this like everyone else. Three o'clock in the morning, my wife woke up and said, I am freezing. So staying there for several hours, probably as close as I've ever come to seeing the face of death, because you're all alone and the house is cold and it, it's an old house and you see things that you're not supposed to see. I was letting the cold come and take me over. And then I started to have a talk to myself, like, why is this happening? You get real close to God, you start saying prayers, because the cold is coming through the walls at this time, it's numbing you, you start to lose rational thought. I knew I could be okay if I could just quit thinking about death. Something inside of me, something deep inside, fought back. And having seen prayers for two hours that I could see the sun come up, I woke up at 5.30 and I saw the sun come up. And from that point on, I knew it was going to be okay. Our look back at Winter Storm 09 continues. Tragedy strikes as line workers tackle the enormous task of getting the power grid back online. But up next, the disaster proves to be too much for local governments to handle on their own. A look at the state and federal response straight ahead. The damage from this winter storm stretched our resources well beyond anything a local government could handle. And it drew a quick response from Kentucky's government. But as you'll see, one other state affected by the storm was busy dealing with something else. The worst I've ever seen, I think, as far as devastation from an ice storm. 60,000 people across the state of Kentucky are without power right now, with the worst problem being right here in western Kentucky. We have Governor Steve Bashir on the phone right now, and Governor, from what we understand, as bad as things are, we are not in a state of emergency. Is that correct? Well, we're not yet, but we are considering that as we speak. There's no heat. Poles down every corner, and I had a hell of a night. There's no light. I don't know what to do. Wire everywhere, and it's just, it's total destruction. There was hardly any help. Oh, God, help us. How about now? The emergency declaration will help us better protect the citizens of Kentucky. It means local governments will have access to the state's emergency fund to pay for overtime and other resources needed to clean up in the aftermath. The sheriff on the way in was showing us some of the uh, power line difficulties and, and uh, tree damage. And last night about 9 o'clock, the president called me in Frankfurt. And by 10, President Obama declared the state of Kentucky a federal disaster. We've got a lot more help on the way. National Guard! We just want to make sure that everybody has uh, the basic necessities, food, water. 
Transportation is another major concern. Still today, trees block roads. Guard members follow heavy equipment pushing trees away. Until now, neighbors and local leaders have been on their own. Last count, 74 National Guard units on the ground, 68 more on the way by 5 o'clock this afternoon. Marion Mayor Mickey Alexander and Judge Executive Fred Brown are grateful for the help these National Guardsmen are providing. Are carrying water and ready to eat meals with them. If someone is out there and they find them, they need water or something to eat, they give it to them. Even if they have generators, food and water, they're, they're happy just to know that someone has been out to check on them to make sure they're okay. The governor is already starting to examine the state response to this disaster. Well, we'll always learn things uh, anytime you go through this. I can't see us having much up in the city of Metropolis before the first of the week, if any. The mayor of Metropolis is also concerned about other communities in Illinois who are without the aid from their state or federal governments. We deserve better and we are going to demand better. I mean, uh, my citizens deserve to be treated like first class citizens. Now I've asked the president yesterday to to declare us a major disaster. Uh, that will start the, the money flowing in terms of reimbursement for city and county and state governments. It's just amazing how people are coming together after this disaster and it's just, I don't know, it just touches my heart to see people actually coming together, you know, with everything going on in the world, you know, they're still here for us. Well, it's one thing to have no phone or electricity, but many people would have gone without food, water, or a warm place to stay had it not been for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA. Though FEMA had its critics too, as this crisis continued mm -hmm. from hours into days, some local officials wondered aloud, where's the cavalry? Right now, officials are trying their best to distribute essentials, but the supplies are dwindling. We, we need more water and more food for uh, the people. Uh, we, need, uh, we need kerosene uh, and, and, and those kinds of things because people are heating their homes with, with kerosene heaters. So. FEMA is assisting the state with supplies. The state has established two logistic staging areas. Now, the situation is also dire in Lyon County, with 100% of that county still in the dark. That's right, and emergency officials there have been able to get their hands on generators, but those generators are being used only for the vital necessities. We have not heard from FEMA. We have not heard from the Red Cross. Uh, we're, we're, we're on our own. But I can get you some canned goods. Darlene Timmons has been here at Helping Hands in Smithland for the last week, working to get whatever she could to the people of Livingston County. The basic needs are, are water to drink because most of them don't have anything to drink and then something to eat. Now, help has finally arrived from FEMA in the form of water and food. It's a lot of help. I've got three families from Lyon County right now living with me. And to help distribute it, the National Guard. We're obviously wore out, tired. Well, FEMA workers have joined the relief efforts today in Lyon County, Kentucky. That's right. It was a very hard hit area and emergency workers there are hoping to make a lot of progress today. And we have Jamie Green, Sergeant Jamie Green from Lyon County Emergency Operations on the phone right now. And uh, Sergeant, update the situation for us there, if you will. We actually just restored some power in the city of Eddyville. Now here's your 10 at 10. And we start tonight with breaking news. That's right. FEMA reports emergency meal kits given to storm victims in Kentucky and Arkansas may actually contain peanut butter involved in that massive recall. Well, we've heard a number of reports that scam artists are selling generators off the backs of trucks. They're encouraging people to buy the more expensive units with the expectation that FEMA will pay them back. We can't stress enough, there is no truth to that whatsoever. As Winter Storm 09, your local storm stories continues. You can make it through a disaster like the one that hit our region on government help alone. Yeah, it also takes simple acts of kindness to look at neighbors helping neighbors a little bit later. And utility workers pour in from all over to help. But up next, the drive to get the power restored takes a tragic turn. Well, the storm knocked out power to tens of thousands of people, leaving some in the dark for weeks. Yeah, utility crews from across the nation poured into the region to help local workers with this enormous task of getting everyone back online. We didn't expect it to be quite this bad. The power pole was 
telephone and fire on it. Telephone bolts down. When this thing hit, it exploded on the ground. I'm Garen Thomas. We'll have an update on power situations. It's freezing rain. Is it causing some power problems? Now, here's the problem facing our crews today. It got so cold last night, the ice actually froze on the lines and weighted it down. As you can see, it snapped poles in some of our area, and unfortunately, that's a problem that's going to take days to fix. More than 100 Southern Illinois Cooperative workers will be up through the night trying to restore power to homes. We have probably two weeks to three weeks worth of work we must do. Power crews working to restore electricity in Lone Oak early this morning. These crews uh, seen arriving here coming from as far away as Wisconsin. You're looking at crews from McMinnville, Tennessee that have been brought in by Jackson Purchase. The progress that we're doing, people are actually starting to see work from that. Uh, you know, their, their lights are coming on because of that. Roughly 500 homes are still without power in Metropolis. That number is slowly, will slowly drop the rest of the week as homes are brought back online individually. We're stacked up from floor to ceiling in here. These linemen coming in from, I guess, all over the country. Where are you guys from? Alabama. Alabama. Alabama, thanks for coming. All of us have put our lives on line and our lives on hold to get this uh, restored. It's just nice to be able to come up here and help, too. We appreciate y'all telling you. Line workers have some of the most dangerous jobs in the country. One lineman from out of state who sacrificed time with his family just to come and help our region and help restore power wound up losing his life. This has been the biggest disaster, uh, natural disaster in the state's history. It's just unimaginable. It's just been, what is it, day nine? Today, it'll be 21 days. Power crews continue to work around the clock to restore service to folks in our area. Additional crews from other states are pouring into this region to give a helping hand. Well, we Thank sure appreciate y'all. You have to think about what might go wrong. I'd say on a scale of 1 to 10, we're right up there at a 10 as far as being one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. They've worked hard. They've worked safely. Uh, we've had a few minor things until this event occurred, and it uh, it literally took the sail, wind right out of our sails. We start tonight with breaking news. Two line workers are in the hospital after falling nearly 40 feet just before 6 this evening. One man is stable while the second one is in critical condition. The one man was hurt pretty bad. The pole snapped. Both workers come off the pole. Um, I know the pole had a transformer on top of it, and it fell as well. It is bad, real bad. And we are working breaking news this midday. We have word that the Jackson Purchase electrical worker who fell from a utility pole on Clark Line Road on Tuesday has died. very very tragic thing that happened and uh, our hearts really go out to the to the family and he was willing to come down here um, and sacrifice himself uh, to get the people of Kentucky back up and back up and running utility workers across the region came out in force to honor the memory of Andy Reichwein this afternoon we know what he does every day what he did every day and we are gathering here to honor the memory of one of our fallen brothers. Andy was a, um, a journeyman lineman. He was also a gentleman. He's also a good friend. Andy sacrificed potentially a Valentine's Day with his lovely bride and his little girl to come to Kentucky. He sacrificed when he had an accident. It's a tragic event where someone came to Kentucky to help us in our desperate time of need. Andy Reichwein was a hero to Kentucky. Andy Reichwein was a guest worker from Minnesota. His giving spirit continued even after his death. Reichwein's family made the decision to donate his organs in the hopes that others might benefit from their loss. Winter Storm 09, your local storm stories continue. The storm left hundreds of thousands of tons of debris scattered across the region. A look at the cleanup effort a bit later. And as you've seen, it also brought out the best in a lot of people. Total strangers oh. lending helping hands, help that saved lives. That's straight ahead.
Winter Storm 09 was the worst natural disaster in Kentucky's history. But as we've seen before, tough times can also bring out the good in people. Here's a look at some of the random acts of kindness we captured during the storm and its aftermath. Okay, well, it is in times like these that it is very important to help one another out. Yeah, and we got a great story here. Now, Local 6's Beth Bradley knows from personal experience, uh, that would be her truck right there. <laughs> when she went to check on her car, a little later, the two men stopped, helped her out. He said, in these times, it's just what you're supposed to do. They got her pulled out of this uh, and the ditch that she was in. Hey, there it is, right there. Oh, she's dancing. That's she's pure happy. joy and the thumbs up. <laughs> Volunteers passed out 4,000 bags of ice, 60,000 bottles of water, 4,000 gallons of kerosene, and food that went so quickly it couldn't be counted. It seemed like everybody's just pitching in and helping everybody. Well, as so many utility crews continue to restore power across our region, area schools are thanking those linemen and companies for all of their hard work. Inside Crittenden County Elementary, third grade classrooms are jumping right in to show utility crews they're a cut above the rest. After all the thank yous are collected, teachers will pass them on to local utility companies. We hope it cheers them up and makes them feel happier inside. Now, here's the problem. The Hodges are using a generator to heat their home right against the back here. No windows were cracked, so by the time the Boy Scouts arrived, the couple was slowly being poisoned by carbon monoxide. But I didn't realize it till it was just almost too late. These guys came in and told me I needed to go to the hospital. They saved, <laughs> saved my life. Like, it makes me proud that I'm a Boy Scout. Covering Winter Storm 09 was quite a challenge. Yeah, Local 6 reporters share some of their own stories of trying to deal with their own storm-related problems while doing their job of bringing you the news. That's coming up a little later. And just about everywhere you look, downed trees and limbs. The enormous task of cleaning up after the storm straight ahead. We are going to continue to feel the effects of Winter Storm 09 for a very long time. That's right. Even now, there's still a lot of debris to be cleaned up, but folks wasted no time getting started as soon as the weather broke. This is Local 6 at 5. You see it everywhere. Piles of debris littered across our viewing area. The ice is mostly gone, but the aftermath remains. Ice has melted, and what's left of the storm is now littering trees and yards. Tell you what, the number of downed trees and limbs in our viewing area, it is, it is enormous. In Paducah alone, city leaders estimate they weigh a total of 100,000 tons. A strong, gusty wind has the potential to create a dangerous situation out there. And if you've got a road that's blocked or a front yard that's a mess, you know how eager you are for it to be cleaned up. But don't let that eagerness let you fall victim to a scam. It was a common sound in our area today. Unfortunately, so was this. These winds created a dangerous situation for folks like Crystal Fuller, just trying to pick up the pieces from Winter Storm 09. And you can see the trees around us and their uh, limbs just hanging down like broken arms. The worst storms to hit our viewing area is really bringing out the best in people. The work is hard. And there's no end in sight. But the Southern Baptist Convention and several other volunteer organizations are knocking on strangers' doors to help. We enjoyed working with the people in Joppa. It's a little bitty town in the middle of nowhere, you know, but, but the people are good people and, and they need help. The state of Kentucky has now stepped in and offered a helping hand to counties buried under those mountains of tree debris. Local 6's Jennifer Horvelt joins us now live from Marshall County. And Jennifer, a lot of people there have to be very happy that there's going to be state help for this, what is a monumental task. It's just the news James Kane was waiting for. Now that he knows the state will help counties clear debris, he can finish the mammoth job of cleaning up the debris in his yard. Kane's not sweating the details. He's just glad to know he's getting help for a yard full of winter storm 2009's mess. I can be hauling probably till July. And uh, so what they can take from me is a whole lot of help. Well, winter Storm 09, you know, the storm knocked out power to some areas for weeks. Yeah, but people did their best to go back to work, mm -hmm. present a strong front, and even when things were difficult at home, as Johnette Warwick reports, mm -hmm. a Marshall County woman slept at work to keep her business going as usual. Business is a little slow at the Village Styling Shop on Benton's Town Square. 
But now that the lights are back on in the business district, customers are starting to trickle in again. Well, good to see you. And getting a haircut and talking to an old friend just might make Orville Woodcock feel a little better. I was wondering how if everybody's doing. Virginia Whitaker has cut hair here since the early 1960s. It's her home away from home. But for almost two weeks now, it's been her home permanently. Like many of her customers, she has no heat or electricity at home. You know, my lights is gone, my water's gone, and everything, but at least I'm alive. And I had this to come to. And she smiles when she says she's been sleeping every night, sitting up in a chair. If I slept on the floor, I couldn't get up. Virginia eats dinner at a nearby church and knows she could stay in a shelter, but... It's hard going from one place to the other. I'd rather just get set up in one spot and stay there. Besides, Virginia says she's used to adversity. She's one of 11 children and raised three of her own all by herself. And if you think about it, there are advantages to sleeping at work. One thing about it I like, I'm here on time. I never was on time <laughs> when I had a place to stay, but here, I can just jump right up and get with it. To get her through the night, Virginia has a lamp and her favorite book. I'm making up for a lot of lost time. And she's optimistic she'll be back in her real home and a real bed soon. And we received some good news from Virginia after her story first aired. Her power at home was restored the very next day. That's good news. Well, Local 6 also had its share of people living at work during the storm and its aftermath. We'll hear some of those stories a bit later. Yeah, but coming up, a couple that's lived through a string of natural disasters, including Winter Storm 09, Hurricane Katrina, and more. But when we returned, for a while it seemed we just couldn't catch a break. Meteorologist Kyle Mount shows us some of the weather setbacks that people had to deal with in the aftermath of the ice storm. Two weeks after the devastating ice storm rolled through our area, families and volunteers were putting in some pretty long hours. Neighbors were helping each other get down trees cleared away, and power crews were working 16-hour long shifts just to get the lights back on. Progress was being made. Unfortunately, a new storm was developing out to the west, and this time high winds would be the culprit, bringing a renewed threat of the lights and, more importantly, the heat going out once again. First, it was the ice. Now, howling winds have hit our area, trying to blow away anyone working above ground. That wind feels like about to pick me up out of the bus. We're 30 as we go to 4 a.m. on Wednesday, and these are sustained winds with higher gusts that, again, could be above 50 miles per hour as we go through our Wednesday afternoon. On February 11th, strong winds blew for much of the day, putting more stress on communities just trying to get the lights back on. The strong winds rocked this gas station awning and sent a tree crashing through a Harrisburg boy's bedroom window. Fortunately, no one was hurt. There was also no out driving the wind either. This tractor trailer was blown over on Highway 45 in Graves County. It's like a tornado almost. Uh, I'd rate ice as, a, for me, the scariest, like what we just had a couple weeks ago. And right below that would be the wind, high, you know, wind like that. Of course, one of the most disappointing results from the high winds, more than 3,000 homes were once again in the dark and the cold. Several things had to come together to get our near hurricane force wind gusts. First, we had a strengthening area of low pressure. Notice these white lines or what we call isobars. The tighter they are together, the stronger the winds will be. At the same time, up in the upper levels of the atmosphere, we had winds of 110 miles per hour. So as the storm system raced off from Missouri up into Canada, we had the winds coming down behind the system and gusting at times over 60 miles per hour in Paducah, even over 70 miles per hour in Owensboro. The strong winds also caused headaches for construction workers. Montgomery Gardens owner Richard Montgomery said the frame of his new building was swaying when he arrived and just minutes later the wind knocked it to the ground. It just makes you sick, you know. Um, Again, I, I'm just I'm just thankful no one was out here uh, working, and, and uh, thank goodness we had rain this morning where the workers weren't here. Hopefully Mother Nature will calm down a little bit. I think she's had it in for me the last couple of weeks since I was in that ice storm. And I'm ready for springtime. 
unfortunately, the winds relaxed pretty quickly as the system raced off into Canada. These were, however, the strongest winds the area has experienced since Ike rolled through last September. For a lot of people, Winter Storm 09 is the worst natural disaster they've ever experienced and hopefully never will experience anything like that again. But a Lyon County couple says they've been through similar situations before. Dottie and Ronnie Brown moved to Eddy Creek two years ago. Now, in the past four years, they've been through three hurricanes, one tornado, and now an ice storm. Photojournalist Chad Darnell met with a couple who, at the time, had been living, get this, 19 days without power. We're thankful that we've got this. We figure that uh, within in a week, maybe a week and a half, no more than two weeks, that we would have electricity. But I'm, I'm almost certain it's going to be a couple more weeks before we get it. Nobody has come to check on us. Uh, nobody from Lyon County has knocked on my door. Nobody comes out here offering us help or anything, or even to see if we're alive. We could be dead. This is 19 days, isn't it? Three hurricanes in one year, and then a, a tornado, and then the ice storm. It was, it was our dream home. But that's all gone. Being in Katrina and what happened to us there, and, and not only did we lose everything, but some of the stuff that we could have saved, they came in and stole from us. I've only been out of the house three times since this happened. Uh, I'm just afraid to leave. I guess I'm, I'm just paranoid, thinking, you know, that the same thing could happen here. Because it reminds me of the hurricane. We just didn't have the water. We were down there Thanksgiving this past year and it, it still looks like a war zone looks like a war zone here well you do think what in the world's going to happen next you know i mean what why why us never never thought i would experience this yeah like i said i i think it will be uh, at least two weeks and maybe longer from the looks of things out here a lot of poles down a lot of trees and i wish it was sooner and i couldn't find them but the worst is really over with. Said so after it's all done and over with and cleaned up, uh, we'll be back to normal. It'll be good to go. We, we've had to do without our water. We've had to do without electricity. And we've had to do without heat. But we're still very fortunate that we have our home to, to live in. There are so many stories to tell from Winter Storm 09. People who've lived through it all, had experiences they'll remember for the rest of their lives. And that includes our local six reporters. Coming up next, Johnette Wark sits down with them for a roundtable discussion on covering the storm. Also ahead, putting the storm in historical perspective. How does Winter Storm 09 rank with past weather events that have affected our region? And also, lessons learned. How emergency officials feel about their response. And is there anything they would have done differently? Everyone who lived through Winter Storm 09 has a story, and that includes our reporters here at WPSD Local 6. Uh, they have quite a, a few good stories to tell, so we have gathered them all here in the studio to talk about Winter Storm 09 and, and their reflections on it. And right before the storm came, our weather authority said catastrophic several times. We knew the storm was coming, and when you're a reporter or an anchor, that means you've got to be here. It doesn't matter if there's trees ag across the garage or yeah. whatever. You have to be here on a day like that. Within five minutes, I was in a ditch. Um, <laughs> I, I was trying to go around one of the many trees out there, hit a little piece of ice, and, and I was in a ditch. And this was at night. This I mean, is at three, three, three in the morning. morning. That's scary. And Mason came to get me, and I've never been so excited to see Mason in my whole life. <laughs> He's a photographer. Here. He's a photographer here, and I, I, I mean, Mason thought I was nuts, but I was just like, oh, I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> I really didn't realize how bad it was, how bad it was going to be our, because no one could imagine that it was going to be as bad as it was. Until me as a reporter was out there with a photographer on the fourth of the tank of gas, <laughs> waiting in line for an hour, hoping that there would be some gas left for us. You don't realize how bad it was. We did pack our bags, we did bring our toothbrush, just in yeah. case we got stuck at the station that night and apparently some of us did. Yeah. I know Jennifer spent the night, Garen, you spent the night. Who else spent, uh, spent, the, Beth night? spent the night? I was too afraid to drive. <laughs> As we were covering the stories and coming back with the stories, we would all be talking about 
our own experiences and do you have power and, and how is your house looking and how are things like where you are we run home and get things and come back to the station because we were you know doing coverage pretty much all day you know going through so it was exciting at the same time as you know a little nerve-wracking as well you know people got kind of cabin fever after a while yeah. of you know wanting to go home and be with their own families or check on things uh, but it was a good experience you, you know I think Garen touches on something a lot of times we cover stories and we're not a part of the story yeah. I think yeah. we all became a part of the story we because were, yeah. we were going through what everybody else was going through um, you know and I think that became obvious when people started staying overnight. I was one of the stubborn ones who went home and I wanted to sleep in my own bed, but I got to work and, you know, Garen's walking around with yeah. his PJs yeah. and, you know, <laughs> Lauren's showing up to dry her hair. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, we all of a sudden I saw was each other. <laughs> I didn't have power, but I washed my hair in the cold and then I came in at 10 o'clock at night <laughs> during the shift with the hair dryer, plugged into the generator, and when I heard the whizzes of my hair dryer, I was like, yes! I mean, yeah. was Despite sort of the laughs, it was worth it. He will, of course, be there as well, and we will keep you up to date on what he says. And All of a sudden, we were on the air continuously, going from early in the morning until late in the evening, because folks were telling us we were their lifeline, mm -hmm. that the only thing they could get was 87.7 on their battery-operated radios, mm -hmm. and so we had to broadcast in order order to reach them. We didn't have scripts. No. I know you guys would go out <laughs> and you would gather the news yeah. and upon coming back you didn't write anything. You just marched right out here to the desk and started telling us what happened. It was, not, it was nice not to have a script. <laughs> yeah. In other ways it made it, it easier, was. but it, it was very different. It, it was really very different. Journalism kind of in its raw form. You know, mm -hmm. we were going out, shooting the video, a lot of times people at home see the finished product, they see, you know, the scripts and, and everything all put together. We were kind of thrown off at times because it was just like, okay, put a mic on, go, do this. And the photographers, the editors, you know, they were, weren't really cutting the video, they were just trying to get stuff, you know, on the air. And uh, a lot of times we were saying, look at that video, and because we're so used <laughs> to people having power. It, you know, it's the first time we'd seen it, but we had to realize that people can't see us, they're listening to us. And so uh, we had to sort of rearrange how we did things and how we said things. You would just go and try and get as much information as you could. Where are the shelters? Where are they handing out bottled water? And you wouldn't stop to go to the bathroom. You wouldn't stop to eat. You just push yourself harder than you thought you ever could. And when you came back, you still felt guilty that you were coming back to the station that mm -hmm. most of the time had heat, most of the time had electricity. You still felt guilty coming back here. Because and, you were warm and you had wished, water. And wished you could have stayed out longer with the people who were watching you, who were depending on you. This really touched my heart a lot. We talked to um, one gentleman, and uh, he was with Jackson Purchase Energy. He had come from East Tennessee, I believe. And um, he had mentioned that he was happy to be here because he knew that any of us, if they were going through the same thing in East Tennessee or, or anywhere else, that folks from here would go to, to help him. So that, that really meant a lot to me. And they've got their own families to worry yeah. about, you know? I mean, this, this poor Andy Reichwein, I mean, he's left a four-year-old daughter, family members, oh. but literally put his life on the line to, to help people here um, get power back. And when you see the work that a lot of these guys are doing, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing that there haven't been more accidents like this. I mean, okay. we, sometimes we, we see the footage that, that the photographers bring back, and there are people in trees with chainsaws mm -hmm. with one hand. As the, as the shot pulls back and you can see how high up they are mm -hmm. and it just looks so dangerous. It's, it's amazing to see the risks that are being taken to restore power to clear the tree. Well, you have to think all these systems, especially the rural electric systems, those were created over years and years and years of work and infrastructure. I mean, we didn't just have lights all of a sudden one day. A lot of those systems were created and, and added onto over time and they have rebuilt them in a month. And that just, that's just amazing to me. Literally rebuilt years and years and years of work in a month. I remember the Hickman fire chief told us he went door to door, just volunteered, worked an 18 hour day. Mm -hmm. And at one house, they found an old couple side by side in their lazy boy recliners, huddled up with blankets, holding hands. And if those door to door checks wouldn't have been there, if they wouldn't have gone, knocked on that door, who knows what would have happened. I think really there was a community here at the station that started to help each other because. Not only were we helping one another, but some people, you know, production, their families were staying here, 
as people started to get power back on, you were giving rides, showers. Gabriel showered at my place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. And uh, Todd Atchison, the web uh, journalist, he uh, came over and did some loads of laundry. So there was a community that started to build amongst the co yeah. <laughs> Well, we certainly learned a lot in Winter Storm 09, and we've got much more on lessons learned coming up, as well as how our storm ranked with others in our region. Stay with us. As destructive and historic as Winter Storm 09 proved to be, it was not the first time that Old Man Winter has brought our lives to a standstill. To put our recent storm in perspective, let's look back on a couple of winter storms that many of us are familiar with and one that's a bit deeper in the history books. Now, just a few years ago, a record-setting storm left our area paralyzed just three days before Christmas in 2004. On December 22nd, a system tracking across the Mid-South resulted in a classic setup for snow and lots of it. Over 14 inches of snow fell in Paducah, breaking a one-day snowfall record and in parts of southern Illinois and southwest Indiana. Those totals approached two feet. Winds of nearly 40 miles per hour caused near blizzard conditions and snow drifts up to five feet. And snow plows were no match for the snow as roads became impassable. Highways were shut down and the National Guard had to rescue hundreds of drivers from stranded vehicles along Interstate 24. Adding to the problems, the weight of the snow caused a number of roofs to collapse and businesses were forced to close, lost millions in revenue. And now we've all heard the stories of grandparents being snowed in for weeks and walking through deep snow drifts just to get to school. Most of those stories we know are exaggerated, but the blizzard of 1978 is one that lived up to the hype. This time, the temperatures are much colder and it's much more dangerous. It could be called the perfect storm. On January 24, 1978, two systems to combine to form what many have called a megastorm over the central U.S. Barometers plunged to levels typically found only in a hurricane, resulting in dangerous winds and brutal wind chills and high snow drifts covering tractor trailers. And in Kentucky alone, state and federal highways were shut down. Highway 45 between Mayfield and Paducah was covered in five and six foot snow drifts. Motors were stranded for several cold days and nights and unfortunately for some, help didn't come soon enough. 70 people lost their lives in that storm. Now, a generation has passed since the blizzard of 1978, but it's been over a century since a storm led the great orator Irvin Cobb to coin the phrase White Week to describe two severe ice and snowstorms in late January of 1902. Yeah, exactly 107 years to the day before Winter Storm 09, White Week coated the area in over two inches of ice, causing extensive damage. In Paducah, live wires fell across the city, causing the city to shut down power, and nearly all 1,200 of the city's telephones fell silent. Repair costs approached a quarter of a million dollars to repair McCracken County alone, quite a sum in that day. And in nearby Marion, Kentucky, the Crittenden County Press described the devastating personal losses suffered by orchard farmers when their newly planted fruit trees were snapped at the trunk. White Week led some like Cobb to comment on the beauty of the winter scene. Others like photographer W.G. McFadden shared Cobb's vision of beauty, but commented that while the experience had been worth a great deal, nobody but a stark lunatic or an Arctic explorer would ever care to have that repeated. And little did he know that 107 years later, thousands of folks across our region would share in those same sentiments. Even though Winter Storm 09 recovery is far from over, first responders are already meeting to determine how they might have handled things even better. As one leader said, while they never could have anticipated the magnitude of such a threat, they certainly learned from their experiences. Looking back on the storm, officials admit they had action plans, but... Even those were tested and we had to improvise as we went along. There's a tree hung over the telephone line. First responders had no power. Fuel, major issue. Telephone falls down. The telephone system failed out into the county. Multiple trees 
impassable. And impassable roads kept them from even responding. Yeah, I'm trying to get to you. Callaway County Emergency Management Director Bill Call says a dedicated emergency operations center is needed. You'd uh, have your resources all in place and the community uh, uh, workers would know exactly where to go. McCracken County Emergency Management Director Bob McGowan says plan your shelters in advance. Where can you send people? Nobody has electricity and it's cold. Several locations answered the call, including the high school in Graves County. If we had six, seven hundred people in that shelter. At a joint emergency personnel meeting, the crisis switched from ice to fuel. We had to find a facility that had a lot of fuel and also was able to fuel motor vehicles. And generators. There wasn't any power to the uh, pharmacies, grocery stores, there wasn't any power. And hospitals and nursing homes and things that all running on generators. We hope to have more generators next time. And a backup phone plan. If our uh, cell phone communication was better, that would, that would be better. In hindsight, they say things could have been much worse. Just everyone helping each other make the difference. We hope we never experience another natural disaster like this one, but the lessons we've learned will certainly protect us in the future. And as we conclude this special presentation of Winter Storm 09, your local storm stories, we want to share a few photos we received from you that show not only the beauty and the danger associated with this storm, but the courage and the perseverance of the people who live through it. Thank you for watching.